Book One, Part Two of Herodotus Histories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Histories, Volume One by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, translated by A. D. Godley. As time went on, Croesus subjugated almost all the nations west of the Halys, for except the Cilicians and Lycians, all the rest Croesus held subject under him. These were the Lydians, Phrygians, Mysians, Mariandinians, Calibes, Paphlagonians, the Thracian Thinians and Bithynians, Carians, Ionians, Dorians, Aeolians, and Pamphylians, and after these were subdued and subject to Croesus in addition to the Lydians, all the sages from Hellas who were living at that time, coming in different ways, came to Sardis, which was at the height of its prosperity. And among them came Solon the Athenian, who after making laws for the Athenians at their request, went abroad for ten years, sailing forth to see the world, he said. This he did so as not to be compelled to repeal any of the laws he had made, since the Athenians themselves could not do that, for they were bound by solemn oaths to abide for ten years by whatever laws Solon should make. So, for that reason, and to see the world, Solon went to visit Amasis in Egypt, and then to Croesus in Sardis. When he got there, Croesus entertained him in the palace, and on the third or fourth day Croesus told his attendants to show Solon around his treasures, and they pointed out all those things that were great and blessed. After Solon had seen everything and had thought about it, Croesus found the opportunity to say, My Athenian guest, we have heard a lot about you because of your wisdom and of your wanderings, how, as one who loves learning, you have travelled much of the world for the sake of seeing it. So now I desire to ask you, who is the most fortunate man you have seen? Croesus asked this question, believing that he was the most fortunate of men. But Solon, offering no flattery but keeping to the truth, said, O king, it is Tellus the Athenian. Croesus was amazed at what he had said, and replied sharply, In what way do you judge Tellus to be the most fortunate? Solon said, Tellus was from a prosperous city, and his children were good and noble. He saw children born to them all, and all of these survived. His life was prosperous by our standards, and his death was most glorious. When the Athenians were fighting their neighbours in Eleusis, he came to help, routed the enemy, and died very finely. The Athenians buried him at public expense on the spot where he fell, and gave him much honour. When Solon had provoked him by saying that the affairs of Tellus were so fortunate, Croesus asked who he thought was next, fully expecting to win second prize. Solon answered, Cleobis and Biton. They were of Argive's stock, had enough to live on, and on top of this had great bodily strength. Both had won prizes in the athletic contests, and this story is told about them. There was a festival of Hera in Argos, and their mother absolutely had to be conveyed to the temple by a team of oxen. But their oxen had not come back from the fields in time, so the youths took the yoke upon their own shoulders under constraint of time. They drew the wagon, with their mother riding atop it, travelling five miles until they arrived at the temple. When they had done this and had been seen by the entire gathering, their lives came to an excellent end, and in their case the god made clear that for human beings it is a better thing to die than to live. The Argive men stood around the youths and congratulated them on their strength, 
The Argive women congratulated their mother for having borne such children. She was overjoyed at the feat and at the praise, so she stood before the image and prayed that the goddess might grant the best thing for man to her children Cleobis and Bitone, who had given great honour to the goddess. After this prayer they sacrificed and feasted. The youths then lay down in the temple and went to sleep, and never rose again. Death held them there. The Argives made and dedicated at Delphi statues of them as being the best of men. Thus Solon granted second place in happiness to these men. Croesus was vexed and said, My Athenian guest, do you so much despise our happiness that you do not even make us worth as much as common men? Solon replied, Croesus, you ask me about human affairs, and I know that the divine is entirely grudging and troublesome to us. In a long span of time it is possible to see many things that you do not want to, and to suffer them too. I set the limit of a man's life at seventy years. These seventy years have twenty-five thousand two hundred days, leaving out the intercalary month. But if you make every other year longer by one month, so that the seasons agree opportunely, then there are thirty-five intercalary months during the seventy years, and from these months there are one thousand fifty days. Out of all these days in the seventy years, all twenty-six thousand two hundred and fifty of them, not one brings anything at all like another. So, Croesus, man is entirely chance. To me you seem to be very rich, and to be king of many people. But I cannot answer your question before I learn that you ended your life well. The very rich man is not more fortunate than the man who has only his daily needs, unless he chances to end his life with all well. Many very rich men are unfortunate, many of moderate means are lucky. The man who is very rich but unfortunate surpasses the lucky man in only two ways, while the lucky surpasses the rich but unfortunate in many. The rich man is more capable of fulfilling his appetites and of bearing a great disaster that falls upon him, and it is in these ways that he surpasses the other. The lucky man is not so able to support disaster or appetite as is the rich man, but his luck keeps these things away from him, and he is free from deformity and disease, has no experience of evils, and has fine children and good looks. If besides all this he ends his life well, then he is the one whom you seek, the one worthy to be called fortunate but refrain from calling him fortunate before he dies. Call him lucky. It is impossible for one who is only human to obtain all these things at the same time, just as no land is self-sufficient in what it produces. Each country has one thing but lacks another. Whichever has the most is the best. Just so, no human being is self-sufficient. Each person has one thing, but lacks another. Whoever passes through life with the most, and then dies agreeably, is the one who, in my opinion, O King, deserves to bear this name. It is necessary to see how the end of every affair turns out, for the god promises fortune to many people, and then utterly ruins them. By saying this, Solon did not at all please Croesus, who sent him away without regard for him, but thinking him a great fool, because he ignored the present good, and told him to look to the end of every affair. 